billionaires and mega corporations with deep ties to China control America's mainstream media. Does that affect how we see China? Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Surfshark. You should be using a VPN like Surfshark to protect your identity every time you go online. So, I was reading this really funny story the other day from my favorite Chinese state-run media, The Global Times. It was straight out of 1984. A freedom is slavery kind of thing. Listen to this. The pandemic has upended many perceptions including ideas about freedom. Citizens of China don't have freedom of speech, freedom of worship, or freedom from fear, but they have the freedom to move around and lead a normal day-to-day -day life. In a pandemic year, many of the world's people would envy this most basic form of freedom. Speaking of the freedom to move around and lead a normal life in China, here's a recent video that shows what happened when a woman walked out of a quarantine zone in Shenyang. Yeah, that video of China's freedom to move around and lead a normal day-to-day -day life was from last week. Man, only Chinese state-run media could come up with something as twisted around as this. Then I noticed my mistake. I wasn't reading the Global Times. I was actually reading the New York Times. Yeah. In this article about China's version of freedom, it says, the global crisis could plant doubts about other types of freedom. Nearly half of voting Americans supported a president who ignored science and failed to take basic precautions to protect their country. Yeah, you filthy Trump supporters are why we need China's authoritarian model. Sorry, I meant China's freedom model. As the New York Times says, the West may find it has to work harder to sell its vision of freedom after China has made its model seem so attractive. Oh yes, so attractive. Sure, the regime has put more than a million ethnic Uyghurs in concentration camps, but at least in China you don't have to wear a mask. Unless you're harvesting organs from political dissidents while they're still alive. Then obviously, wear a mask. That way, they can't see your face as you remove their liver. So given the New York Times is so quick to parrot Chinese state-run propaganda, I started to wonder, how much is American media co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party? Obviously, that's not easy to investigate, especially for a small YouTube show like ours. This may surprise you, but our budget isn't as big as, say, the New York Times. This is the New York Times headquarters. The logo on the outside is bigger than our entire office space and studio combined. But even without the New York Times' stupidly large budget, I could find enough publicly available information to make me very worried. For example, did you know that many corporate media outlets like CNN, The Washington Post, MSNBC, and yes, New York Times, have all enjoyed private dinners and sponsored travel from an organization tied to the Chinese Communist Party's United Front. I can find that out just by searching publicly available filings done by the Justice Department as part of the Foreign Agent Registration Act, or FARA. The group is called the China United States Exchange Foundation. It's a nonprofit initiative founded by Tung Chi Hua. Tung used to be chief executive of Hong Kong. He's now the vice chairman of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, a key part of China's United Front strategy. According to this report by the U.S.-China Security and Economic Review Commission, the United Front strategy uses a range of methods to influence overseas Chinese communities, foreign governments, and other actors to take actions or adopt positions supportive of Beijing's preferred policies. And Tung's organization has lots of ties to the United Front, as we talked about in this China Uncensored episode from 2017. And it has worked with multiple think tanks, lobbied the U.S. government, and even sponsored meetings between retired U.S. and PLA military veterans. 
I'll put a link to that China Uncensored episode below. So how has this China-United States Exchange Foundation been targeting American media? Well, according to this far of filing, it partnered up with the American lobbying firm Brown Lloyd James, or BLJ. And what did BLJ do for the China-United States Exchange Foundation? As they put it, in order to develop favorable coverage in key national media, BLJ will continue to organize and staff familiarization trips to China. This includes recruiting top journalists to travel to China, selected for effectiveness and opportunities for favorable coverage. In 2009 alone, BLJ arranged two visits with journalists representing top publications in the United States, including Newsweek, The National Journal, The Nation, Congressional Quarterly, U.S. News and World Report, the Chicago Tribune, and the Washington Note. Okay, I don't know if those are all top publications. I'm pretty sure the Washington Note is just one guy. But it's not the size that matters. Because BLJ boasts that they secured the publication of 26 opinion articles and quotes within 103 separate articles on behalf of the China-United States Exchange Foundation. Remember, this is a group getting its money from the Chinese Communist Party, specifically to influence how Americans think about China. And that was in 2009. By 2011, they'd done better. From this far of filing, we see that BLJ arranged private dinners on behalf of CUSEF with some major media, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. That filing also shows that BLJ arranged China visits for journalists from NPR, The Atlantic, Yahoo, Bloomberg View, MSNBC, and Reuters. There are lots of these FARO reports over the years. And they show how major mainstream corporate media entities have been getting fancy meals and free trips to China. In this article by Vox, criticizing Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un, they put a disclaimer at the bottom saying the author wrote it while he was on a free trip to China sponsored by CUSEF. No mention of its links to the United Front or the Chinese Communist Party. And Vox's reporting, as always, is independent. In fact, CUSEF brags about this in its brochures. Here's one from 2012. It says that it took four separate media delegations to China, including reporters from the Washington Post and Bloomberg News. The photo is American journalists getting a tour of Huawei. But here's why this isn't a smoking gun. Yes, these media groups and journalists were getting private dinners and sponsored trips to China. It sure makes them look bad, but it doesn't prove that their reporting was influenced by that. Yeah. But that doesn't matter, because there's actually way bigger concerns than travel and food. I'll tell you what it is after the break. Welcome back. So those free trips to China and private dinners with a group linked to the Chinese Communist Party sure seem sketchy. But it actually gets much worse. If you've seen our early episode, How Five Mega Corporations Control Everything You Watch on TV, you know five mega corporations control everything you watch on TV. And guess what? Those companies have deep financial interests in China. Same with major newspapers. The largest shareholder of the New York Times is Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim. Slim? Maybe let's just call him Carlos. Anyway, Carlos has important Chinese investments. For instance, he worked with China's JAC Motors to make cars in Mexico for the Latin American market. Forbes said it was a way of circumventing the Trump administration's trade policies. And the New York Times has been very critical of Trump's China trade policies, like with opinion pieces like this. And this, and this, this year, Bloomberg reported on a deal between Carlos Slim and Huawei. You know, the Chinese company that poses a national security risk. So Carlos Slim has vested interests in China. Do his Chinese business deals influence how the New York Times covers China? It's hard to say. And New York Times journalists 
have occasionally done some really solid reporting on China, like this expose on how China organized mass detentions of Muslims. But with certain sensitive China topics, the New York Times won't cover them at all. Like how Chinese state-run hospitals, like this one, are systematically killing Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghurs for their organs. And the New York Times isn't the only American newspaper owned by a billionaire with deep ties to China. Let's look at billionaire Michael Bloomberg. According to Mr. Bloomberg, Chinese leader Xi Jinping is not a dictator. The Communist Party wants to stay in power in China, and they listen to the public. Xi Jinping is not a dictator. He has to satisfy his constituents, or he's not going to survive. He's power. not a dictator? No, he has, to, he has a constituency to answer to. Is Gave the him check on him just a revolution? You're not going to have a revolution. Nobody, well, then no then. government survives without the will of the majority of its people. Okay? Now, totally separate from that, Michael Bloomberg's personal fortune is largely dependent on him being in the good graces of the Chinese Communist Party. You see, the biggest part of his company, Bloomberg LP, is selling Bloomberg terminals. They provide financial data to professional investors. They make up around 85% of the company's profits. Thousands of those terminals are in China. And their expensive monthly subscription relies on access to Chinese data. And guess who controls access to China's financial markets? The Chinese government can shut down Bloomberg's data access at any time. And that would affect Bloomberg LP's entire business, not just in China, but in every country where it sells terminals. Of course, the Bloomberg terminals are also a way to send billions of U.S. investor dollars to China. And over the last couple years, a Bloomberg index fund has helped support 364 Chinese firms by directing an estimated $150 billion into their bond offerings, including 159 controlled directly by the Chinese government. How has Bloomberg the business affected Bloomberg the news outlet? Well, Bloomberg News has certainly been critical of the trade war, with articles like, Trump's trade war with China doesn't look like a win, and trade war madness puts world on thin ice. Bloomberg News has actually been accused of curbing articles that might anger China. Ironically, that was in the New York Times. Bloomberg also had a special code they put on sensitive articles they didn't want published on Bloomberg terminals inside China. Because again, Bloomberg Media is part of Bloomberg LP, which gets 85% of its profits from those terminals, which require access to the China market. The former Bloomberg CEO said, if you have a $9 billion company that is about to be crippled by a news division that loses $100 million a year, shouldn't you take a breath and think about the implications of what you're doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't take a breath. I'm too busy choking on my rage. In fact, let's take a commercial break. Then I'll be back to talk about Jeff Bezos. Welcome back. So how about Jeff Bezos, the billionaire owner of Amazon.com? He owns the Washington Post. Bezos has said Amazon is well positioned to serve China. I mean, not so much serving the Chinese laborers working long hours in unsafe conditions in Amazon's China factories. Bezos must have been talking about serving the Chinese government for his own financial benefit. We also know the Washington Post has accepted millions of dollars from a Chinese propaganda outlet. Actually, several major newspapers have. The Washington Post got $4.6 million. The New York Times got $50,000, and the Wall Street Journal got a cool $6 million. I mean, democracy dies in darkness, so you gotta pay the electricity bills somehow. So these examples were all individual billionaires who own newspapers and have deep financial ties to China. I can't believe that's a thing. Now, when it comes to TV networks, they're tied even more deeply to China. Most of them are owned by one of these five mega corporations I covered in my episode from 2018. 
They all have major interests in China. For example, CNN is owned by Warner Media. Back in 2013, when it was called Time Warner, it invested $50 million in China. At the time, the CEO said, Increasing our global presence is one of Time Warner's strategic priorities, and China is one of the most attractive territories in which we operate. But it is complex. There's all kinds of ways these shady multinational corporations may influence the media companies they own to benefit their China investments. For example, remember the story of Democratic California Representative Eric Swalwell, an alleged Chinese spy, Fang Fang. According to Fox News, many major media weren't giving this story airtime. NBC and MSNBC are owned by Comcast. Top shareholders there include Vanguard and BlackRock, both of which invest heavily in China. CBS is owned by National Amusements. That runs Paramount and MTV, and China is a major market for both. CBS also has business interests in China. And CBS even censored their show, The Good Fight, for a musical short that made fun of Chinese censorship. And what about Disney? Disney, of course, has huge interests in China. Shanghai Disneyland, the enormous movie market there. And that time they filmed Mulan in a place just a short drive from concentration camps. And then they thanked the Chinese groups involved. Well. Disney also owns ABC and ESPN. ESPN, by the way, does not like their staff discussing Chinese politics. Unless they're showing China's political map on the broadcast, complete with China's outrageous claims that it owns Taiwan and the entire South China Sea. So most of the mainstream media have a corporate side that's totally in bed with the Chinese Communist Party, a brutal authoritarian regime. Again, I'm not saying I can prove that this affects their reporting, but it does raise questions. Like, why did the mainstream media cover up the Hunter Biden China story? And why is Carlos Slim not slim? But you know, I do know one reputable source for China news, China Uncensored. You should definitely subscribe to that channel if you don't already. The link is below. And this episode has been sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN that lets you protect your identity when you go online. It helps you hide your IP address. And that's important because the government, giant corporations, and individual hackers may be monitoring the websites you visit and what you post online. With Surfshark's camouflage mode, even your internet provider can't tell that you're using a VPN. That helps you stay private. Plus, Surfshark's clean web mode lets you browse the internet free from ads, trackers, and malware. So stay safe by using Surfshark. Try it out with our special deal that includes 83% off a two-year plan, plus three extra months for free. Go to surfshark.com uncovered. For just $2.21 a month, you can get Surfshark on all your devices. So click the link below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America. Uncovered.